If you owned an Asus motherboard or a laptop in the late 2000s, you might remember that before your OS started booting, you sometimes saw a splash screen for something called ExpressGate. Now, maybe you investigated this and figured out what it was, maybe you just figured out how to turn it off, or maybe you ignored it completely like I did, but either way, it's always lived in the back of your head, because even if you did check it out, even if you used it, you probably still wonder just what it was all about, how it worked, who it was for. Well, good news. I have the answers to the questions that you didn't really care enough to ask. This is episode two of Quick Start, a show about fast booting built-in operating systems from the late 2000s. And if you want the full backstory, you can watch episode one, but it's not necessary. All you need to know is that in the late 2000s, a lot of low-end computers, especially laptops, took a really long time to boot. Uh, partly that was because hard drives were slow and SSDs weren't common yet, and partly it was because Windows had become a lot bigger and more complex when Vista came out. PC builders mostly just ignored the problem and let computers be slow and miserable for a few years, but some companies tried to actually solve it. They couldn't make Windows any faster though, and they wouldn't sell you better hardware for the same price, so the most common solution was to offer a second, much more lightweight operating system that you could boot into instead of Windows. In this episode, we'll look at probably the most popular one and the one you might have owned without even realizing it. Asus put ExpressGate in front of tons of people, although most of us never bothered looking into it. Uh, it was, in fact, a rebrand of a third-party software package called Splashtop, and that is, in fact, related to the modern application by the same name, but only because the same company made both of them. Nowadays, that company is actually named Splashtop, and the product they make is a competitor to TeamViewer, but they used to be called Device VM, and the Splashtop they were selling in 2007 was a completely different product. We're gonna get into the whys and wherefores behind that, but you know, if you used ExpressGate in its day, you probably didn't know any of that. You probably didn't even know you had it. You just bought a computer, turned it on, and found out purely by accident that it had this feature. So let's do that. We're gonna jump into ExpressGate totally blind and see what the experience was like. This is an Asus P6T Deluxe V2. It's one of the many desktop motherboards that came with ExpressGate built in. It uses a socket 1366 i7, and it came with 12 gigs of RAM, so I just left all that in there. I'm gonna install a basic graphics card, and obviously we're gonna need a keyboard and a mouse. And that's it. I'm not adding any kind of storage. There's no hard drive, no USB drive, nothing. And now we're gonna go ahead and power on. And here's that splash screen that so many of us were baffled by. Now, if I were to just wait for a bit, uh, like 10 seconds, this would proceed with ordinary boot, which would of course fail since there's no hard drive. So instead, I'm going to mouse over here and click on web. And this will proceed with boot and we'll count it off. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, and we're booted to something. Okay, it was probably like 12 seconds because I was talking instead of counting. But anyway, we're here, wherever here is. Okay, so your PC might boot this fast nowadays, but back in the late 2000s, when almost everyone was using spinning hard disks, 60 seconds was a pretty reasonable boot time, and lots of computers took a lot longer than that. Uh, the machine we looked at in the last episode took four minutes to reach a usable desktop. So booting in 10 seconds versus 240 was pretty astonishing. But what exactly have we booted here? Well, I don't think we need to drag that out. This is Splashtop, a specialized distribution of Linux. I don't think anyone's surprised by that. Linux GUIs have a certain sheen, especially in this era. It's unmistakable. Besides that, while it was starting, we briefly saw the classic X mouse cursor. So yeah, it's pretty obviously Linux. And it makes perfect sense to use Linux for this purpose because it has no licensing costs, which is important when you're trying to add features without any price bump, uh, but also because it can be pared down to an absolute minimum viable product. Part of the reason that Windows Vista took so long to boot is that it was loading support modules for an incredible variety of things. Uh, Prefetching software just in case you decided to start a given application, checking all the OS files for corruption, and so on and so forth. Vista has to load hundreds of files to boot. Linux can get away with like a half dozen, and that's why you can use it to run a crappy home router or a DVD player that only has eight megs of memory and has to boot in just a few seconds. But for this to work, you need to remove everything the user isn't gonna need. And how can you know what that is unless you know exactly what they're going to be doing? 
general purpose operating systems can't know that. A user could start any imaginable application, a notepad, a web browser, Photoshop, a video game, whatever. So how did device VM deal with this conundrum? Well, it's very simple. They made sure they did know what you'd be running by delivering the least functional Linux distro in existence. For instance, there are no device drivers. It's, that's not an exaggeration. Modern Linux distros have support for tens of thousands of devices going back to the 90s, and in some cases the 80s, but this one has nothing. You might have noticed when it starts up that it takes a noticeable amount of time to draw the browser window, and that's because this has no graphics driver. Uh, since this is a desktop motherboard, they couldn't have known what graphics card you were gonna put in it. Normal Linux solves this problem by including, or at least making available, all kinds of drivers for AMD and Nvidia and Intel, and particularly in this era, those were all famously unreliable. They might have tried to enable features your card didn't support, or they were just plain buggy, uh, plus they might take up more system resources and so on, so device VM simply included no graphics drivers at all. What we're looking at here is a variant of the X windowing system called X Visa, which talks to your graphics card with the Visa BIOS protocol directly. That's the universal basic language that every graphics card has spoken since the early 90s. It's incredibly inefficient. It has no hardware acceleration, so screen updates are agonizingly slow, but the code is so microscopic they could just build it directly into the X server. It'll work on any graphics card that can be physically plugged into this board and it will never, ever crash. And that's the philosophy of Splashtop, include nothing that's unnecessary. And that's why there's a grand total of five applications, really four, since one's a lie. We have web, games, photos, chat, and Skype. That's it. You can pick one from the boot splash like I just did. I selected web so it booted up and immediately opened the web browser. And that turns out to be a heavily modified Mozilla Firefox. Now this is from about 2008, so if we try to actually go anywhere, obviously that doesn't work because the SSL suite is decades out of date and even if we could get there, this browser doesn't support 80% of the JavaScript that's in heavy use these days. But we can go to websites that aren't modern web 5.0 trash fires. Uh, here's mine for instance, this is limited to HTML2 with some light CSS, no JavaScript and no SSL, so it loads just fine. Wow, there's apparently something wrong with my website because this page is throwing all these SSL warnings. There shouldn't be any SSL here at all. What, what happened? Well, that was weird. Anyway, here's my cat. If it was 2008 right now, this would be perfectly viable for accessing the web. Uh, it even sports Adobe Flash, so you could keep up with Homestar Runner. Beef. Stew. Yep, it's busted. <laughs> Since this is Firefox, which was more or less at the top of the browser game at the time, it naturally displays contemporary websites with no problem, but that's all it'll do. Every unnecessary function has been removed. So if we go up here and start picking through the menus, for instance, uh, assuming you're familiar with late 2000s Firefox, you'll notice that a whole bunch of stuff is missing. Uh, for instance, there's no save option in the file menu. It's just gone. And that's not all, Device VM came through with a machete and ripped out everything but basic browsing. So if we go to tools, there's no add-on manager, uh, there's no settings section other than the basic proxy configuration, and, and there's no download manager because as you might have guessed by now, this OS is almost entirely read-only. Obviously you're able to write data somewhere, otherwise they'd have had to remove the bookmarks menu, but that's still here and it works. And there's a few OS settings you can adjust. If we go down and pull up the control panel, we get, you know, date and time, input language, you can change the screen resolution, uh, and you can define some network settings. If we were on a laptop, we could even join a wireless network. And you certainly wouldn't want to re-enter your IP info or your Wi-Fi password every single time you reboot it. So there's some capacity for saving data, but it's strictly limited, again, to things the developers could predict. I'm not 100% sure how this file system works, but my assumption is all the things you can edit live in a very tiny partition, maybe just a few megabytes, and the rest of the OS is totally read-only. So there's nowhere to save files inside this environment, and you can't access anything on your normal Windows drive, probably because in this era, NTFS support under Linux wasn't entirely reliable. You could safely read a Windows disk, but writing to it was usually not recommended. So this OS has basically no ability to work with files. It's just intended for cloud use. And yet, if we go down to the toolbar here and we hit the disk icon, it pulls up a file browser. 
That seems pretty nonsensical, and sure enough, with the limitations in place here, it's not clear why they included it. So I'm actually just gonna hook up a hard drive with a Windows install on it to make my next couple points. All right, the hard drive's connected, I rebooted the machine, we're right back where we were, and you'll notice right off the bat that there's nothing in the folder tree except media and there's nothing inside there. You can't see the ExpressGate file system or the hard drive. The only thing this will ever show is a USB drive. So if I pop one in here, that shows up right away and I can browse the disk, but there's very, very, very little you can do with this. This file manager is based on an existing open source project called PC Man FM, and they left most of it intact. So there's built-in icons for all sorts of things. Um, MKV, EXE, text files actually get a little preview. AVIs have icons. So it looks like this stuff is gonna open if you click on it. It even displays thumbnails for uh, JPEGs, uh, TGAs, stuff like that. But there are basically no file associations here. Nothing happens when you click any of this stuff. And of course, yeah, you know, they didn't ship a media player, they didn't ship a text file editor, nothing like that. We just have the five applications at the bottom here. So it makes sense that so few of these things work, but you'd think that they would have filtered this to only the file types you can actually do anything with. As it happens, that's just JPEGs. They open in the photo viewer, but uh, we'll look at that later. And even though the photo viewer works, it's kind of unpleasant to use, and you'd hope you could just like drag a JPEG into the browser window, but nope, that doesn't work. The browser has been gimmicked, so it's impossible to load files from your hard drive. You can't drag things into it, the file menu has no open option, and while it does technically support the file colon slash slash prefix for local disk access, it only seems to work uh, with files launched from the file manager. And the only thing I found in the file manager that that works with, for some reason, are batch files, which open in the browser as text. So that's weird. Otherwise, any attempt to navigate to a folder, for instance, or to a file within that folder, just stops dead and clears the address bar. The file browser itself also has no address bar, so you can't just point it at the root of the system or anything like that. And to make a long story short, I've spent several hours trying to jailbreak this thing in every way I could think of, and it really seems like you can't. There are ways to hack it, I'll touch on those later, but I was hoping that, for instance, device VM had missed a browse file button buried in the Firefox settings, something like that, that would let you, you know, browse to a terminal app and open that and, and actually get control of the system. Being able to do that without modifying the OS would have been neat, but even if that was possible, this has been scraped of all useful utilities, so it'd be pointless anyway. Thus, as far as I can tell, there's only one file operation this OS is capable of. If you click a file in your browser that can be downloaded, it'll let you save it to a USB stick. That's it. I think it's already becoming clear that ExpressGate was intended for non-computer experts. Even Device VM probably realized that no nerd would touch this with a 10-foot pole. I mean, that's not true, apparently, because a few people commented on my last video saying they did use and love ExpressGate, but I'm not sure what, to be honest, they got out of it, and most of the comments I got were from people who said that they tried it out, thought it was dumb, and never touched it again. This was, generally speaking, not for us, and that's a bummer. If the file browser let you see your local file system, you could use it for data recovery, even if you don't have access to a live CD or USB to boot from. If it had a terminal that let you check your file system when your normal OS won't boot, or you could write out a live image to a USB drive from inside this environment so you could do proper recovery, this would have been a nerd darling. We would have loved it in 2007. We, we would have celebrated it. It would have been talked about on every overclocking forum on Slashdot, the works, I mean, I've thought that computers should have built-in operating systems of some kind since I was 12. I think it should be legally required, so I'd have been all for it. But this isn't that, and I'm not super sure why. And yeah, obviously you don't want to confuse the average user with the whole list of accessible file systems, you know, show them their hidden Windows recovery partition and all that, but why not hide it behind an advanced button? It's free real estate. And my first thought about why they didn't do this was, well, they don't want to pack this full of drivers for everything under the sun, so maybe they skipped the disk and file system modules to keep bloat down. But that was really the only explanation I could think of, and you'll find out momentarily that that's definitely not the cause. Let's move on. So far, we've seen over 50% of what this operating system can do. Let's see the rest. The next app on the bar is Games, and it's fake. It's actually just a link to a website 
that is of course long dead, but once offered a bunch of presumably free casual games, presumably all pretty miserable, presumably all flash sludge as typical of the time. So there's that. The next icon is for the photo manager. And this is where I get to make another crack about crappy flash software, because this is also that. Here it is. And right off the bat, if you right click, you get the mark of the beast for the mid 2000s, the little menu that was the equivalent then of the feeling you get now when you realize that an app's been made in Electron. It told you you were probably about to have a very mediocre time. And indeed you would, because this is an extremely limited program. Here's what we can do with it. We can select a file off of our USB disk. Okay, I've just realized this is running at 800 by 600 and we can't see the entire user interface. This, this doesn't work correctly unless it's at at least 1024 by 768. So why did they offer the option? Changing resolutions requires restarting the OS, by the way. It's very quaint, very 90s. Here's what it can do. We can open our USB drive. We can select an image. We can rotate it. We can zoom. And that's, that's pretty much it. It's like all we can do. We can add the picture to an album, but I'm not sure why you'd want to do that because you can't read those albums from Windows and they'll only work if the USB drive is plugged in. So like, what's the point? You can also supposedly upload pictures to Flickr, or at least you could in 2008 when the API still worked. But yeah, there's nothing more you can do here as far as I can tell. Or at least that's what I thought until I took another look while I was tuning up this script. And I noticed there's these two folders up here at the top. Now, remember when I said a minute ago that ExpressGate won't read the host drive because of reasons? Well, it turns out it will do that just only here. Nowhere else in the entire operating system, just here. When I was initially testing this and writing the script, I didn't have a hard drive connected. But once I hooked one up, I realized that when you open user folders, hey, would you look at that? That's your user folder from inside Windows. In fact, the uh, added folders option here lets you navigate your entire disk. You can drill down anywhere and select a folder to view from here. So device VM did bundle file system and disk drivers. They just won't let you use them for anything practical. Yeah. Anyway, that's all there is to the photo manager. So we can move on to the chat app, which turns out to be Pigeon. They didn't even bother renaming it. Uh, this is the multi-network instant messaging client that used to be called Game uh, and used to be pretty damn popular back when there were actually IM networks it could connect to. Uh, it goes without saying that this one won't connect to anything anymore since it only supports AIM, Google Talk, MSN, QQ, and Yahoo, all of which have evaporated. There was an IRC plugin for this and that would still be useful, but of course they didn't include that for some reason. Were they, were they doing this on purpose? Were they trying to drive away nerds? Maybe that's it. They didn't want nerds using their operating system. We'll now move on to the final app, which we don't even really need to open. It's Skype, which was massively popular in the late 2000s and useless now since they shut down the network. And that's it. That was Expressgate. You just saw it all. When your motherboard gave you that splash screen and you ignored it, this is what you were ignoring. Nothing of consequence. And it was really easy to ignore. It was easy to not realize that you had ExpressGate, despite it being unavoidably obvious, because we're conditioned to expect and ignore noise from our PCs. As far as I know, Asus never really advertised this thing except on the motherboard box, which was covered in loud, nonsensical ad lingo that we learned to tune out. We ignored the box and looked only at the spec sheets and usually on independent review sites. They mentioned it in the manual, but show me a nerd who reads manuals. And there were settings about it in the CMOS setup, but that's full of stuff that you'll never understand. Things intended to support one weird application out of millions, like a C1E support or adjacent cache line prefetch. This just got ignored along with all that crap. And when you powered up, of course, your machine would display a huge full screen express gate banner encouraging you to select an option or text that said express gate not present. And that should have made us curious, but apparently a lot of people, including myself, just looked straight past all of it. I don't know if I can speak for anyone besides myself, but here's my perspective. In the modern era, motherboard firmware can look very impressive and featureful. If you reboot your PC and hit delete, you'll probably wind up in what looks like a complete operating system with mouse support and full color graphics. And you can actually do stuff inside of it. There's gauges that show your system health. You can flash your BIOS, you can pick a boot device and you'll just instantly boot into it, stuff like that. 
That's what we see of our motherboard's intrinsic capabilities nowadays. Assuming, of course, you see it at all. Modern PCs can boot so fast that we don't even get to see the BIOS. We power on and we're immediately at the OS boot screen or even directly at the login. In 2008, on the other hand, EFI barely existed and motherboard firmware didn't look very impressive. It was still BIOS based, or at least it looked that way. So what you saw of your motherboard was a bunch of meaningless text that hadn't changed or been useful to anyone since 1993, which you had to wait through before your OS started booting. And if anything went wrong, you got this error message in all caps as if it was written for a computer from the 70s. The only other part of the motherboard that you ever interacted with was a text mode config tool that hadn't really changed in 20 years and looked like it was built for a 386. It usually couldn't do anything imperative, like flash your BIOS or boot a particular device without saving and restarting. And a lot of the time, if there was a built-in boot menu or anything, you had to struggle to get it to come up by hammering a key on your keyboard as quickly as possible. And often as not, it wouldn't notice and you'd have to reboot and try again. So to me, motherboard firmware at the time felt janky and incredibly stagnant. It was like they were just buying the same chunk of pre-rolled BIOS code that was first published in like 1996 and making the tiniest possible changes to fit the board before shipping it. And that's probably exactly what they were doing. So I knew it was conceivable that a motherboard could have built-in functionality beyond verifying DMI pool data, but I just didn't think any company would have bothered. So when I saw the ExpressGate splash screen, I think I assumed that it was either an overly elaborate BIOS flashing tool that I didn't care about, because that was a thing at the time, or some kind of ad. I mean, this was the era when they started adding boot screens that advertised the board you'd already bought. Motherboard companies live in this terrifying purgatory where they make expensive products that nobody interacts with directly. It's incredibly hard to make someone love a thing that exists solely to make someone else's thing work. Computers look like their OS, not their hardware. And I think that I figured this ExpressGate thing was some desperate attempt to make me notice that my motherboard existed. It's like that bit about how every important message from your bank is, hello, we are your bank. And like I said, even if we'd known what it was, most nerds wouldn't have used it. I don't think it's good. I think it's bad, actually. But Asus disagreed so hard that they decided to put it on everything. I put that on everything. In 2008, Asus made a press release saying they'd be shipping ExpressGate on all motherboards to the tune of millions a year. And they really did it. I've been told that even workstation boards were getting this thing. And I'm not really sure why. Let's ask the question. Even if this isn't for us, who was it for? On what grounds did Asus sell this? Well, they advertised it on the front of the box and what it says there is five second boot up to online. Well, we saw about 10 seconds, but we'll give them that one. It lists web browser and Skype as features and that's it. There's no further detail on why a five second boot up was valuable to you. The back doesn't say anything. And if we look at the inside flap, it mostly says the same stuff again. Five seconds from boot up to online, access the internet, instant messenger, friendly picture manager. That's all it says. It's just a dry listing of features. So Asus's marketing sucked. What did other people have to say about it? Well, here's a review from overclock3d.net, and what it says is, ExpressGate is a nifty Linux-based OS that offers basic functionality outside of your main operating system. In a nutshell, it's quite a responsive operating system with a very intuitive interface. Okay, uh, let's try another. This is a Nantech. They explain how you access ExpressGate and what it can run. They say it doesn't crash and that it worked with the websites they tested. Do you notice that nobody is actually saying why you'd want to use this? They're describing it, but they aren't painting a picture of someone enjoying it, uh, probably because they can't imagine why someone would. In fact, Tom's Hardware in 2009 described this as the automatically enabled express gate function, which slows boot times without adding functionality. And that's exactly how I perceived it at the time. It was simply a 10 second delay in the boot process, end of line. I tried to find a review that describes the experience of using ExpressGate in any depth, and I came up dry. Most of them just mention it as if you already know what it is from some earlier review. Many just have it in a list of bullet points and don't spend a single editorial word on it. The only exception I found was a review from NeoSeeker from 2008. They spend a whole page on the topic, but it's just dry screenshots of all the apps, and then at the very bottom, there's a single line. ExpressGate is great for letting guests use your PC without giving them access to your desktop. Now that's an interesting idea, because I feel like 2008 was, if anything, the heyday of viruses. 
There's another home star runner. There's another home star runner clip there. Uh, well, you have to do the voice. Now. Computer over. Virus equals very yes. That's not a very good prize. It's a pretty scary thing, letting a visitor use your Windows PC, even if they're on a limited user account, you know they could still do damage. But if you drop them into ExpressGate, I promise they aren't gonna be able to hose your system because it's so limited, it literally can't hurt anything. Even if there had been viruses for desktop Linux at the time, there's no software on here that one could leverage to do any harm. Chances are your host disk isn't even mounted unless you start that silly photo app, so you're decently safe here. And you know, a lot of folks have family members who just can't seem to stop destroying their own computers by clicking things they shouldn't click, so you have to keep going over and reloading their machine over and over. Well, it might sound a little callous, but you could just unplug the hard drive, let them use ExpressGate. They can't break it. Nobody can break it. There's nothing to break. And that's a cool marketing angle. Too bad Asus didn't use it. They didn't bother writing virus proof on the box for this board. Even the manual doesn't mention anything. It doesn't say your PC will always have an OS no matter what, even if your hard drive crashes. All it says is that you could boot quickly. That's the only suggestion Asus has for why you'd want this, and I'm not sure why that would be appealing on its own. It's like the Sony laptop from episode one of this series. That shipped with a Linux-based DVD player that you could boot into instead of Windows. And the only argument Sony could offer for why you'd want that is that it boots quickly. But that didn't really make all that much sense. Who cares if you have to wait a couple minutes to boot before you can spend an hour and a half watching a DVD? What difference does it make? Now, ExpressGate offers a lot more function than Sony Instant Mode by leaps and bounds, but in this context, it's no more impressive. Instant boot on a laptop automatically makes sense because you're constantly shutting the machine down so you can tote it somewhere and then turning it back on. So fast boot up means less wasted time and since you're on a battery, wasted time is wasted power. So it sells itself to an extent. But this is a desktop motherboard. There's no battery life, and you don't typically power up a desktop for a few minutes just to power it off again when you're done. Usually you're settling in for a bit, so a couple minutes of boot time doesn't really matter. You hit the power switch, you walk away, you grab a drink, and when you come back, the machine's ready to use. So who cares? ExpressGate just really doesn't make sense here but it was a lot more reasonable as a laptop feature. Imagine you open the screen, you hit the power, 10 seconds later you're sitting at a web browser having wasted almost no battery life getting there and not having wasted any time standing in a hallway waiting for your machine to boot just so you can look up one tiny piece of information. In an era before smartphones were commonplace and before sleep mode was reliable under Windows, that might have been pretty compelling. And to their credit, Aces did also sell it that way. This is an Asus EPC, or as I've been calling them lately, the EP. You uh, probably remember these. They more or less kicked off the netbook explosion in the late 2000s with their very tiny screens, very long battery life, and very small price tags. Just about every semi-broke nerd had one back in the day, and it seems like basically everyone agrees that they were wonderful and we're all heathens for abandoning the form factor. I can't argue. I don't even think they should make laptops bigger than eight inches. Now the first EPC came with a special blend of Linux that Asus whipped up for the primary operating system, but not long after that they started shipping machines with Windows and it became the standard OS for the whole model line, which ended up being gigantic. They made dozens of EPCs up until at least 2012, maybe as late as 2014, but they all had fairly similar hardware specs. The first couple models had Celeron CPUs and built-in SSDs, which was very weird for the time, but most of them shipped with ordinary spinning hard disks and Intel Atom CPUs, which were the closest thing Intel got to a smartphone-style SoC. It's not very performant, but it's adequate for basic tasks and very energy efficient, which was the whole point of the netbook. In CNET's review of this model, 2009's EPC 1000HE, they were able to play video for nearly six and a half hours on a single charge, which was pretty impressive for the time. But part of that might've been because it was running Windows XP still in 2009. Let me say that again. Asus shipped an eight year old operating system on this machine. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine running an eight year old OS on your primary PC? Wouldn't that be wild? I can't imagine it, that's just unbelievable. Anyway, since this has XP and a 5400 RPM hard drive rather than, you know, the 4200 RPM ones that were in really tiny machines, it runs pretty okay. It boots to desktop in about 50, 60 seconds, and that's not too unreasonable. So this machine didn't really need ExpressGate, which is why it didn't have it. 
I couldn't get a hold of one of the EPCs that actually shipped with it, but the specs on all of them were pretty similar and you can download an installer from Asus's website that'll add ExpressGate to just about anything. So I've loaded this one with a version they sold on one of their motherboards, the P5Q-E. And I chose that because it's actually a later, slightly tweaked version and I wanted to show you a little variety. So let's fire it up. We'll just turn the machine on. Shit. I love trying to do things and talk about them at the same time. I'm so good at it. Just turn the machine on, takes a moment to power up. And unlike what we had on the motherboard version, this actually shows up in the Windows Boot Manager. So I'll select that. Takes a couple seconds to load. And there it is. It's pretty much what you saw before, just with a new skin. It still has Firefox. It's got the crappy uh, Photos app, the link to the game site. It's got chat, it's got Skype. The only real change is that they've removed the icon for the file manager, but if you plug in a USB drive, it'll show up right there and it pops right up. And it's the exact same experience that we had before. Now this identifies itself as ExpressGate 2.0 and the one on the motherboard was ExpressGate 1. So this has been updated, but it seems like Device VM and or Asus were very happy with the limited feature set. They had no real aspirations. This is ExpressGate. This is rock and roll. And as far as I know, that's it for our tour of ExpressGate on Asus's laptop lineup. Just like with their motherboards, they put this on hundreds of laptop models. I put that on everything. EPCs, Aspires, and everything else. And just like with their boards, it's the same experience on all of them as far as I can tell. They may have shuffled the chairs around a bit, but I think we could go through their whole product lineup 07 to 2011 and not find any meaningful changes. So why did I bother showing this to you at all? Well, initially it was just to have a visual prop. I could point at this and say, hey, this makes a lot more sense than a laptop, right? Look, you don't waste battery time booting up. That's cool, right? Except on this machine, the boot times just aren't all that different. It takes around a minute to start Windows XP and it takes about 30 seconds to start ExpressGate. I know that's twice as long, but you barely notice it really. And that's probably why it wasn't included on this machine. I think Asus mostly shipped ExpressGate on systems that came with Windows Vista or 7 where it would have made a much bigger difference. So we're just having fun here. This isn't really demoing anything, except let's take a step back. It took 30 seconds to boot ExpressGate on here. The motherboard version took 10. So what's up with the difference? Let's go back even further. I'm sure you were wondering just how they got ExpressGate into the motherboard. That's a dumb sounding question, but I think it's accurate to say that Asus made the only PC motherboards in history that had a full fat, no foolin' primetime operating system on board. As limited as Splashtop is, it's still a very impressive feature for a motherboard, but where does it live? How does it boot? Well, there's no spinning disc mounted to the board. Sadly, so it's obviously an SSD somewhere and it's this guy right here that's tucked in between these two slots and there's absolutely no way to get a camera angle to show you what it is. However, good news, these boards were crap. My friend who got this thing for me also got me two others previously, one of which worked very briefly and then died and the other one actually powers on, it posts, and then it complains that a USB port is shorted out, even though I've checked them all and they definitely aren't. That probably means that the current monitoring circuitry inside the chipset fried itself, which is a hilariously 2007 failure mode. But the end result is that I have three of them now and nothing's stopping me from just clipping the module off a dead one. So that's what I did. Here it is and it's very straightforward. On one side, we've got a Samsung chip, which is unsurprisingly about half a gig or maybe one gig of NAND flash. And then on the other side, there's this Fizon chip. Uh, most of the lettering is eroded, so I can't read it, but I poked around online and I'm pretty sure it's just an SSD controller with either a PCIe or a USB interface, which makes perfect sense. And then there's just a crystal on here to provide a clock source for the controller chip. And that's it. Now I have no idea how this communicates with the machine. I poked around under Linux with uh, various tools. It doesn't show up under LSPCI or LSUSB. Nothing appears about it in DMessage. So this isn't just like an EMMC controller that's been built into the board, which makes sense because if it was, then it would probably show up inside Windows and users would be able to jump on there and trash the ExpressGate install. One of the recurring things that you'll hear throughout this series is that computers were slow to boot in the late 2000s 
largely because SSDs didn't really exist yet for the average individual. I mean, they were there, but they were really expensive. But that was ultimately how we solved this problem. If you install modern Windows on a spinning disk, no matter how good it is for a spinning disk, it'll still boot and run dog slow. In fact, as I was writing this in the script, something clicked. All these people who commented on the first episode saying, Hey man, four minutes isn't that bad. My machine takes 15 minutes to boot. My machine takes half an hour to boot. My machine takes six hours. I've been trying to figure out how your PCs could possibly be that slow. Like it literally seems impossible. Do you people have spinning disks? Do you realize how cheap an SSD is now? You don't need a big one. Here, I looked it up for you. 128 gigs, $10. Go pick one up, fix your shit, come on. But SSDs cost at least $200 in 2007 and a lot more for an actually decent one. And that's like most of the cost of an EPC to begin with. So that wasn't really an option at the low end. And system builders couldn't do anything else to fix the situation because they had no direct input on how the software or hardware worked. Dell, HP, Sony, Asus, they don't really make anything. They just glue together other people's products. Motherboards are the same way. Asus has very little editorial control over what they make. They buy the chipset from someone else. They buy the USB controller, the hard drive controller, the Super IO, the BIOS. It's all made by other companies. The only thing Asus brings to the table is a circuit board to wire it all together. The only real difference that ever existed between one motherboard and the next, then and now, is whether they did a good or bad job, straight up. If you bought an Asus board in 2008 instead of an ECS, it was because ECS chose objectively worse parts. Capacitors that die, a chipset with bugs, a noisy DAC. Bad deal! Cars that break down! Feed! Or they didn't pay for a good contractor to modify the crappy BIOS they bought from a ward. With Asus, you paid more because they used the polymer caps instead of the liquid electrolytic, and they got the high-end Intel chipset instead of the VIA. Better ingredients, better pizza, but that's the only thing that ever made them special. It's no surprise that when met with the slow boot problem and no ability to fix it by having all their users buy SSDs, Asus's solution was to ship SSDs because that was the only fix. And you could buy solid state drives, it's just, the only ones that were affordable enough to just build into a board were so small that most Linux distros wouldn't have fit inside them. The SSD that Asus could afford was only half a gig, so that's what they had to use. And they could have hired eight guys to sit around deleting big chunks out of Debian until it fit inside that much space, but again, that's not what Asus does. They don't make things, they buy and resell things, so that's what they did. They went after the one software product that already existed that they could just pay money for, expend no effort, and glue to the hardware that they were already selling to solve the problem. So that's why ExpressGate SSD, the one that's built into these motherboards, took only 10 seconds to boot while the laptop took 30 because this version of ExpressGate loads from the hard drive. Like I said, I installed it. So it's on the same spinning disk that Windows is running from. In fact, it lives right next to Windows and this is a theme that'll continue to crop up as we explore instant on operating systems. This laptop is doing what we would typically call dual boot, but in an unusual way. Many of us have been dual booting since at least the early 90s and the process has always been the same. You install your first OS and then you install the second OS onto a separate hard drive partition. And you do this because they invariably use different file systems that can't coexist on a single partition. So when you install Linux nowadays onto a system that already has Windows, it usually cheerfully offers to shrink the partition to make room. But this process has always been a little unreliable. And I think the folks at Device VM didn't like the idea of an installer that any old user could run that would repartition their hard drive. That might be perfectly ordinary for a person who's gone out of their way to install Linux, who almost certainly understands and accepts the risks of resizing NTFS, but you can't expect Joe Q user to grok that they might trash their system this way especially because a lot of vendors had little hidden recovery partitions on there that probably wouldn't survive the process. So when you install ExpressGate, it just dumps a bunch of files onto the C drive in a folder called asus.sys. If we open that up, here's all the stuff that constitutes ExpressGate. This kernel.bin, I have not been able to pull that apart with any tools at my disposal, but I'm guessing it's a compressed copy of the Linux kernel plus a basic file system. And then all these SQX files, these are the, the rest of the software. There's uh, these BS files, I think these are the base system, and then the VA, I think, are applications. So there's one in here for uh, GDK, there's one for Apache, one for the screensavers, one for the web browser, and so on. These can be easily extracted and they're pretty much just 
you know, normal Linux software packages. If we drill down to this one, you can see it's got all the bits and pieces to get strewn all over the file system. And here's most of Firefox, for instance. All this stuff adds up to about 400 megabytes, so it's actually a little bit bigger than I would have expected. Anyway, they make this bootable by adding an entry to the ntloader boot.ini, which I didn't know you could do. I guess ntloader will let you specify a file name in an NTFS partition. That seems fragile somehow, but anyway. This points to C colon slash DB loader. And I poked around inside that a little bit. It looks like it's probably a modified copy of Grub, the standard Linux bootloader. Uh, and in fact, while I was messing around with this, I accidentally renamed the aces.sys folder. So when I tried to boot up, it couldn't find any of the files and it just dumped me into a Grub for DOS menu. I imagine they're just pulling in an NTFS file system driver and then chain loading into that kernel.bin. It probably just extracts the base system into memory. And then once it's running, it decompresses those SQX files on the fly as needed. So now that we've seen how this works, you're probably wondering if you can mod it. Answer, yes. Since the installable version of ExpressGate is just some files on your hard drive, it goes without saying that people have learned how to hack it. A few websites back in the day had packages you could add by just dropping them into the asys.sys folder. I couldn't get those to work, probably because they were made for some inscrutable sub-revision of the software, but you know, it was probably a decent step towards making this what nerds actually wanted. Something simple and fast that offered a terminal for problem solving and an IRC client for wasting time. There's even supposedly a module that would let you access the file system on the SSD variant, but I don't know if that actually worked and I feel like it defeats the purpose. So in summary, what we have here is pretty straightforward from a technical standpoint, other than the secret hidden SSD on the motherboards, which is pretty weird, I'll grant you. This product is just a very basic trimmed down Linux distro that's using some unusual, but by no means unique techniques to coexist with Windows and to achieve quick boot. It's stuff that, you know, Fedora doesn't do, but it's all been done before. The only thing that makes it remarkable is that Asus did it instead of, you know, some German teenagers. And in fact, Asus weren't the only people who did this. ExpressGate was just their version of Splashtop. Device VM sold it to several other companies. And I'm sure there's more out there than I realize because this topic is incredibly hard to research. Nobody but me has cared about Splashtop since at least 2010, and I don't think anyone really did even then. Like I said, most of us didn't even bother checking out what ExpressGate was. I doubt anyone ever cared to track down the whole family tree, especially since if you actually put in the effort, you just find out there's nothing worth learning. So 99.9% .9 of what I found is just crappy press releases with no details and the oldest blurriest YouTube videos you've ever seen. So every couple weeks I discover a new angle on this stuff that never got mentioned anywhere else. And that means I'll probably find more Splashtop variants eventually, but here's what I've dug up so far. Splashtop was resold by Lenovo as Quick Start, and by HP as Quick Web, and by LG as the atrociously named SmartOn. The computer has a SmartOn. I don't have a working example of that last one, which is kind of a bummer because based on the blurry pictures I found, I think it has some interesting functionality, but I do have specimens of the other two. These Lenovo's and this HP are all running the versions they shipped with, but don't get too excited because the tour isn't gonna take very long. The first one here, uh, Lenovo's IdeaPad S10e, is almost exactly the same as the last two versions we looked at. To fire it up, you just power the machine on and it gives you the splash screen just like the motherboard version did. We'll pick something. It's booted and you can tell this is exactly the same thing, just with a different wallpaper. This is installed on the hard drive, there's no SSD trickery, and there's really nothing to talk about. Everything is exactly the same. Uh, the only thing that makes this special is that this particular machine has a button you can press to skip the splash screen and go straight into Windows, I guess to save you 10 seconds of delay. I'm not sure why Lenovo felt that was worth a whole hardware button, but you know, there it is. There's nothing to write home about. Next up is this Lenovo S10 III from a couple years later, which has been defaced in a way I've never seen before. I think they actually laser etched the school name into the top of this machine. That's, that's barbarian. Now this one, they've made some actual changes. Instead of giving you the splash screen by default, this machine only loads it if you press the QS button to the right of the monitor. And that button does nothing inside Windows. So you could very easily fail to realize the features here at all. The only way to find out that this machine has an alternate operating system is to be 
dinking around with the system while it's turned off and accidentally hit the button. That'll make it power up and boot straight into Splash Top and you'll be incredibly confused because your computer is now running some alien OS you didn't even know was on it. And I think I can safely say this was the experience of every non-technical person who ever bought one of these. Anyway. This version of Splash Top is completely different from the others. If it didn't say the name in the lower left corner, you'd never guess this is the same OS. This is actually the splash screen. Uh, this hasn't actually booted the full operating system yet. Uh, this is the same place you'd, you'd pick one of the big icons before you hit enter uh, on the other machines. But this one instead gives you a list of most visited sites, uh, recently visited sites, and a search bar, uh, so you can jump straight to whatever you usually do on the machine. Uh, once you actually pick something, that UI goes away and it doesn't come back, probably to save memory, but it's still a neat time-saving feature. I'm going to have a terrible time demoing this thing because this machine has the worst trackpad of any laptop I have ever used in my life. Great work, Aces. So here's the desktop and the launcher seems to have a lot more stuff on it. We got the usual web browser, games and Skype, but then we've got email, Facebook, Flickr, Twitter, YouTube, CNN and Pandora. This thing looks absolutely loaded, but of course the reality is pretty disappointing. If we fire up the web browser, sure enough, it's the web browser, no surprises there. And the games icon is still just a shortcut to a web page. You know, Skype is Skype. But when we get to the email icon, something interesting happens. It opens up what looks like a normal program that asks you what email service you use. This got my hopes up that this might include a real email client, but in reality, this is just a weird attempt at user friendliness. Whatever you pick, all it does is open a browser and take you to that website. I don't really know what the point of that was, and to no one's surprise, the rest of these launcher icons do the exact same thing. They just open web pages, all of which are now, of course, broken. Now there is a button that'll let you customize the toolbar, and that opens this library that has a whole bunch more websites in it. And to be honest, this isn't that bad a feature. The preloaded images are larger and look better than a conventional like favorite bar icon would, and this does represent most sites that the average person would have been visiting at that time. If you dig through here, you'll find there's actually a couple real programs. Uh, chat is Pigeon as before, and they still have the crappy photo album viewer. Neither of those have been changed in any way, but what they have added is something that should have been there in version one, a music player. Just like the photo app, this can either play files off a USB drive or it can read them straight off your Windows disk. Just open this here and you can dig through and find any MP3s you have. I imagine it doesn't play anything else. Uh, it's still based on Adobe Flash and that's probably why the animated VU meter only updates at about 6 FPS, but frankly, this is usable enough. I thought it was ridiculous that the first splash top, Asus Express Gate, didn't include an MP3 player, but now that it's here, I think this genuinely meets the needs of the average Joe. It's just not clear to me that Windows wouldn't have. This feature is, again, sold on the basis of fast boot. I mean, it's literally called quick start, like this show. Well, this machine has the original spinning disk that it shipped with, so it should be as slow as it ever was. It came with Windows 7 Starter, but it was wiped when I got it, so I installed 7 Professional, which, if anything, should be bigger and slower. And yet, when I clocked it, the time from pressing power to reaching a desktop was only about 40 seconds, which is peanuts. Now, this is not how the machine shipped, to be fair. Lenovo was well known for really passionately trashing their systems with egregious amounts of shitware. So, Maybe it was a lot slower as sold, it's possible. But the thing is, this came out in the Windows 7 era, 7 was just more efficient than Vista, and I figure by the time this came out in early 2010, the era of breathtakingly slow boot times was probably nearing its end already. I mean, based on my research, most of these quick boot operating systems seem to just evaporate around 2011. Maybe that's because the vendors all realized the software was kind of crappy and that nobody loved it, but it's equally or more likely that it's because of Windows 7's speed improvements, RAM getting cheaper, and so on. Computers were just getting better, so I just don't know that this machine could ever have benefited from quick start mode. 
And that was probably the story with our final specimen as well. This HP EliteBook 8440P came out in late 2010, and it is, relatively speaking, a beast of a system. I think it's 14 inches, it has an i5 CPU, and it has enough ports to be a desktop replacement in a pinch, so it's nothing like the netbooks we've been looking at. You wouldn't exactly balance this on your open palm while you power it up for two minutes to look up a theater schedule, but Maybe you would use it for a prolonged period out and about, I'll give you that. So HP provided their own splash top. And it was, again, a feature you could easily miss. To access HP Quick Web, you have to press this globe icon here that you can barely see. And it's one of those godforsaken uncalled for capacitive sensors, so it doesn't even look like a button. You could very easily think it's just an indicator light, especially because if you do try pressing it, nothing Nothing happens. It takes a good solid second to register a press, and then the machine lights up. <sighs> it takes about 15 to 20 seconds to load, and now you're in Quick Web. And it's called Quick Web because Web is literally all it can do. It launches directly into Firefox, it doesn't even ask. It's permanently maximized, and there are no other applications available. The actual browser is identical to the other splash tops we've seen, it just has a dark theme. If we go through the menus, you can see it's got exactly the same modifications so that you can't actually do anything with it. It'll load websites if they don't exceed 2010 era capabilities, and that's it. The only other part of this that you can interact with is the control panel, which has actually been substantially modified. It's mostly the same usual settings, but they've also added this feature, which wipes the user partition every time you shut it down, which uh, I guess is so if this is a government machine, your porn browsing won't get logged. So yeah, that's, that's quick web. That's all there is to it. We've really had a downhill trajectory here, haven't we? It's time for splash top in review. In my opinion, and being utterly unfair to it, Splashtop had bright beginnings. Things looked good at first, if you were an optimist. In 2007, when it appeared on the first Asus motherboards as a discrete read-only device that could always be relied upon to boot no matter what condition the system's in, that's immune to viruses and disk failures, a computer-savvy individual might have said, wow, someday this could be part of every computer. Asus might really have something here. This could be as universal as pressing delete on startup. They just need to release version two. Make it just the tiniest bit more flexible. This is a prototype, a proof of concept, with Asus funding further development out of a sheer sense of goodwill, which let's admit it is the only conceivable explanation for why they decided to buy millions of licenses for this thing. I'm sure that in a year or two, we'll be getting regular updates instead of a quickly stagnating browser, and it'll have a media player and some really crucial system utilities that we can't live without, and then Splashtop will be the darling of the tech world, equally beloved by people who can only afford crappy netbooks, people who fix computers but never seem to have a Linux Live CD on hand, and people who have grandparents. But that's not how it played out. Instead, as far as I can tell, Splashtop lived on for three, maybe four years, essentially unaltered, and nobody really took any notice of it. In fact, Asus even moved away from it eventually. Some of their machines in 2010 started offering ExpressGate Cloud, which was actually a totally unrelated product from a different vendor, which we'll see in a later video. Splashtop's story just petered out. So in conclusion, if you never bothered to investigate the splash screen on your new motherboard or the weird little QS button on your idea pad, don't worry, you missed nothing. I made this the second episode of this series, not because ExpressGate was the most exciting thing in the world of quick boot operating systems and I couldn't wait to cover it, but because I knew that Asus had shoved this weird product in front of tons of people and left us all baffled for over a decade, and to a lesser extent, other companies had put it in front of more people and left them even more baffled, and I wanted to put it all to bed. I mean, that's literally the reason I started researching this stuff. I was sitting around one day and I said to myself, ExpressGate, what the hell was that? Let's find out. And everything else in this video series stemmed from that question. So I just wanted to get this out of the way so we can move on to the really cool stuff. For instance, even this machine with its intensely boring version of Splashtop has far more fascinating sights to show us. You won't be seeing it again until episode five or so, but if you press the first button on the control strip instead of the second, rather than booting Windows or Quick Web, it boots a secret third thing that loads about five times faster. 
But if you want to find out what the hell that was, you'll have to stay tuned because first we have to dig into the most twisted, cursed piece of software in this whole narrative. And honestly, one of the most abominable solutions I've ever seen to any technological problem in my life. I definitely have not saved the best for last and this video won't even be very long. So bring a new pair of pants. You're going to need them, assuming I can even make it make sense in a video format. I hope to see you when that comes out, but for now, thanks for watching. This series has been a blast to make so far, and if you enjoyed it, then consider subscribing so you'll find out when the next episode drops. Remember to turn on notifications if you want to get a jingle on your phone. If you really enjoyed it though, then consider supporting me on Patreon. These machines represent maybe a fifth of the systems I've bought to demonstrate for you, and there's still more that I have to order on eBay, sight unseen, hoping to get one with an intact recovery partition. I couldn't afford to keep buying these crappy laptops without the support of these folks, who also keep the lights on at my studio and buy about a third of my groceries. So I'm incredibly grateful to all of them. Thank you all so much, and to everyone else, thanks for watching. It's burrito time. Burrito time, burrito time, burrito time.